everyone, Big Noon Kickoff presents Bear Bets, and we are back for week two of the college football season. This is usually my favorite weekend of the college football season to wager on because I think we get a lot of opportunities here from some, some public overreaction to some lines and sides and things. So I, I think we have an opportunity here to uh, make up for, for last week. Hey, we were two and three last week. We got our best bet home. If two and three with the best bet winner is going to be the worst week we have all year, I will take it here in studio this week with me and will be so for every week this year is Jeff Schwartz. Jeff, how was Oregon last week? Oh, it was fabulous. I mean, obviously, 81-7 to is kind of fun, but the kids had the, had the best time. Oregon does it great, and we scored a bunch of points, and so we did a lot of push-ups. So I didn't do a lot of push-ups. The Duck did a lot of push-ups, yeah, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Glad to be here with you. The thing about week two is do you have to rethink everything you thought about a team after week one if a team – performance poorly like, like like at what time do you say to yourself you know what i was wrong about that team i absolutely rethink everything <laughs> after after week one to see if my opinion was right and and a lot of times what, what i will do is i'll look inside of a box score like was it more of a a fluky result was it, was it like a turnover rated thing um or was i just dead wrong about the talent level of a certain team so i think if you're not doing that after either week one or a bad week or a loss and kind of saying, hey, what did I miss? What was I right? Was I wrong? What do I need to learn? You're probably you're probably not doing right if you're always looking to kind of kind of learn and figure things out. So you mentioned Oregon. I mentioned the team that kind of had a fluky loss. So that's going to get us right into the, the first bet of the week. Look, the holy trinity of college football weirdness is Laramie, Rustin, and Lubbock. <laughs> Last week, we warned you about Texas Tech going to Laramie, and it was just a weird situation. They led 17-0. The game wound up going to overtime. They had a 111-yard advantage, plus one in turnovers. It was a weather delay. Somehow, Texas Tech managed to lose that game. And this is kind of like what you were just saying. They're a six-and-a-half-point home underdog now against Oregon. Like, was what we saw last week, does that mean Texas Tech isn't the team that we thought was going to be a Big 12 sleeper or not? Or were we were we wrong? Or was it just a kind of cir a circumstance of all these weird events and just kind of just crazy things happen? Look, I still am high on Texas Tech. I think they have a, a chance to have a very special season. I think you get them at home now off of that game where they really should have won. Look, I had Wyoming, but, 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 they, but they should have won. And you get Tyler Shuck now, former Oregon quarterback, who's going to be a little extra motivated uh, against his former team. But they've, there's some, like I said, some weird things have happened in Lubbock. They pulled some big upsets in the past there, played some big boys really well. But I get that the football argument really doesn't say Texas Tech should beat Oregon because Oregon is a more talented team and a better team. But at the same time, the number, no, the number less than seven is telling me that the odds makers are quite comfortable going into this game knowing that they're they, they knowing that they need Texas Tech. It, it's just money coming in. Okay, you think Oregon's going to win by by seven, which is a very key number. Fine, you're good. So the first real actual wager that I have made this week, all these are real actual wagers that I make. Texas Tech plus a six and a half, and I know, and I know you hate it, and I know you're holding back right now, just I, dying okay. to unload. Okay, so I I wouldn't take Oregon minus six and a half, I, I just as a as a principle, like I'm just not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't bet on Oregon, but any other team, USC, Washington, anyone else, I'm just it's not a, 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 the best wager to take the road team in the situation. But you you have to look at the way Tech played against Wyoming. You mentioned all the things that happened. You know, it was in Lubbock, blah blah blah. They're up 17 nothing. Ten of those points were off turnovers. And they scored three points the rest of regulation. Their offense was not very good. Drops, shut got hit all game, and then defensively they lost a pass rusher and their middle linebacker in week one. So they're, they're down some, some players. And you mentioned it. The hardest part for me as a former player is figuring out the, the wagering mind and the wagering ideas and the former player ideas. Because if you look at this, at, at this on tape and just personnel-wise, there is not a position Texas Tech is better than Oregon at. They're not better quarterback, offensive line, defense. Like, where are they better than Oregon at? And that, I think, is, is, is what I come back to, is that if Oregon is the team that people expect them to be, which is a playoff contender, you go into Lubbock and you win this game by double digits. That is what a playoff contender does. But your point, Lubbock is hard to play. 
right? And Texas Tech is kind of a desperation mode. If they don't win this game, they're, they're 0-2 off a season that we thought as kind of a dark horse mm -hmm. Big 12 contender. And so I think they're going to lose by double digits. I'm not wagering Oregon for this <laughs> because I think, again, that, like, that's against my principles to, to, to wager right. really on, on a road team getting six and a half like that. But Oregon is the better football team. They have better players. Texas Tech struggled to stop Wyoming's quarterback from rushing the football. What's going to happen with Bo, Bo Nix now? Like, I just think Oregon has a lot of advantages, and they're sort of out for blood this year. People are not picking them to be very good. And I'm excited to watch Oregon play this week. I, I think Tech loses this game by by double digits. It's not really an Oregon thing. I just know these teams very well. Um, but you're, you know, your first bear bet is, is Tech plus six and a half. The total in this one, 68 and a half. So very high total. L Lubbock, by the way, the one time I went to Lubbock, was like the greatest night in Lubbock history with the Crabtree Texas game. I, you talk about hard place to play, hard place to get to and yeah. from. Flight, my 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 itinerary on the flight home, it, like there were a bunch of people that drove like two hours to some airport. It's like most of the flights were sold out on Sunday. I found like a Southwest flight that I took <laughs> from Lubbock to El Paso, and then like I had checked check the bed because I was away since like Wednesday or that was the Thursday game prior. So had to like check my get, claim yeah. my bag, go back in, check in for my Delta flight from El Paso to Atlanta, and then Atlanta. Atlanta back to Hartford. So yeah, yeah, through three flights, two airports, and, and two check-ins from uh, Lubbock home. Last one here in this game as we kind of preview all these games going forward. How much do you put into the fact that like Lubbock, as you mentioned, non-conference games, they cover and win a lot of those games? Like, do you, is that a thing that you, even over coaching staffs, over different tenures, do you, do you weigh that in your picks each week? I, I do take it into consideration. Now, it's not all, it's not, it's not the thing that I'm going to say, oh, this trend is tried and true, but I but I do think there are a lot of situations where the teams and the players may change, but the situation remains the same. And the situation is coming home in your home opener in a spot that's typically been very difficult to play. And now you have a, 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 a team on the road off of a massively successful week. And the num but as I say, the, 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 I, Oregon is a better team, and, there, and you know, there's no position unit on yeah. the field that Oregon is better. But the number uh, is telling me yeah. that the odds makers are very content, saying, uh, uh, welcoming all that Oregon money in, and that always. That will always give me pause when I see a number and I interpret it as they're kind of leading you in one direction. And the second game is the exact same yeah. way. Like, I, I, you have something else in this game before we, we want, move on? No, I'm not, nope, I'm good. Because yeah, I was going to say, like, Cal, when I saw Cal getting six and a half against Auburn, I could not yeah. believe the, the number in this game. Let's get to your second bear bet here. Auburn at Cal. Auburn's favored by six and a half. The total is 54 and a half. Auburn beat UMass last week in 59-14, 300 yards on the ground in, in, in the first game with the new staff. But Cal, Bear, Cal, 58 points, the, the most in Justin Wilcox's era. They beat North Texas 58-21. Yeah, Jake Spavlo came in right away and had an immediate impact on that offense. And that's an offense that we haven't seen from the Golden Bears probably since Sonny Dyke was there. And, oh, easily, yeah. And, and it, it, look, the – as long as Jackson is coming back, and I think he is, he and Ott, the running back, who had a massive week last week, I think they're going to give Auburn a ton of problems. I love Cal plus the six and a half. That is my second bear better of the week. I, I took the Golden Bears plus the six and a half. You got the defensive mind of Wilcox. Like, I didn't know what to make of Cal, but it's clear. Look, I know, I know it was North Texas, and they're not a great team, but offensively, they just looked like a competent yes. football team. And Auburn... They've got some injuries as well that they might need to be concerned. And another, uh, you know, this is this this has all the feels and looks of a yeah. of a Pac-12 after dark special out there, at Strawberry Canyon. I, I, I do like Cal plus the points here. I have wagered on this myself. It's worth noting, you know. The 2020 season in the Pac-12 was wiped mostly yep. out for COVID. The next year, Cal was dealing with a bunch of COVID issues. It just was a weird Still, year for yeah. them in, in Berkeley. Other than, than, than if you throw 2021 out, Justin Wilcox is 11-1 straight up in non-conference play. Cal starts fast each and every year. It's a hard place to play. It's a night game. And there's just a way that the Cal plays just their physicality on defense. That's hard for teams mm -hmm. to kind of figure out early in the season. You mentioned Auburn, right? A lot of rushing last weekend, but not great in the trenches. Like a, some some concerns. Right. And the Justin scoring margin that game was like 14 points. He only won by you know by 45. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of meat, I think, uh, for for Cal here. Let's go to the second. 
that Pac-12 after dark game that, that, that you have here at Stanford at USC. Stanford off a win against Hawaii, 34-24, uh, 37-24. Pretty impressive for, for Stanford. I was I was, uh, I was pretty happy with their performance. USC is a 2-0, 1-1 uh, against the spread after two wins, San Jose State and Nevada. They scored a ton of points. Bear, what is your wager here in this game? Like, I, I don't want to overreact to Stanford's win at Hawaii. Like that was a, That's like the closing line value dumpster fire bet. Like they were betting Hawaii like they had tomorrow's newspaper, <laughs> and we, we saw how much the the the, the plus ten yeah. bet all the way down to the plus three. We saw we saw how well that went. Like look, there's little reason to think SC is not going to score at least fifty points in this game. Yes. Hawaii. Hawaii threw for 350 on Stanford with zero threat of a running game. SC's off next week. They'll still have a little bit of extra time before they're up. Their, their game against ASU, like, their offense is still clicking at, at a ridiculous rate. Maybe they're not getting the turnover luck like they did last year, but they might not need it this year. Like I, I, I'm not buying into what we saw with, with, with Stanford going out there at Hawaii, went up by double digits. I, I think SC just absolutely rolls in this game. The only concern I have for this, the only concern I have for this is Stanford is not going to quit at the end of the game. And they're going to keep trying to score and keep trying to score and keep trying to score. And we know Troy Taylor, their, their new coach, came from Sac State. They averaged a ton of points mm -hmm. at Sac State over his tenure there. I can see this being like a two touchdowns they score in the fourth quarter and they cover late. Like that, that terrifies me about this game for, for USC covering. What about for a total? Uh, it's 69 and a half. I'm, I'm going to hit that a, a little bit later. Right? A little later? Yeah. Um, I, I just think Stanford's not going to quit trying to score. And I don't trust USC's defense quite yet. Like, I just don't. Stanford, if we saw in the first game again, spread them out, get the ball quickly. Daniels can run a little bit at quarterback. <sighs> 29 is a lot of points, isn't it? It's, it's a lot of points until it's 14 nothing seven minutes into the oh, game. No. Oh, no. I, I think a first half wager is great in this game. Like, I, I think USC is going to easily win the game, mm -hmm. especially with the bye week coming up next. Stanford has a lot of work to do. I was very happy with the performance against uh, Hawaii in, in, in week one. Let's get to your fourth bear bet. And, guys, you know the Bears wager on these bets because we're going to get into some teams that – We got babe. some good logos there on the bottom yeah. there, those uh, last two games. Temple is at Rutgers. Rutgers fa favored by nine here. The total is only 44. Rutgers off a riveting victory against <laughs> Northwestern, 24-7. to seven. Northwestern, by the way, hasn't won a game on American soil in like two seasons. And Temple squeezed by Akron. They pitched a second-half shutout there. They needed 14 points to beat Akron. Who you got, Barry? That, that was the thing. Temple did not look good in, in the first half against Akron, but in the second half, they allowed like 40 yards to, and, and they won the it's game. It's Akron. It was Akron, but this is Rutgers. <laughs> I know. Well, what did we see from Rutgers? <laughs> they, I, like, like last year, these two teams played a 16 14 game. What has changed so dramatically with the rosters and the programs of these two teams to cause someone to lay close to 10 double digits with, nothing. with written, absolutely nothing? Like, I, I think Temple. Last week, how they played, uh, it would get kind of slow start in the yeah. opener. It's a bad team. It's understood. They're a bad team, too. But at the same time, Rutgers averaged less than four yards to play against that bad Northwestern <laughs> team. But like, Temple's not a great defense, a great team at all whatsoever. But it's clear Rutgers State University of New Jersey, Sunge, still has those offensive Sunge. problems. <laughs> that, that, I, I got the trademark on that, by the way. <laughs> Sunge goes, and I'm so happy because... I actually have one of those old school New Jersey Rutgers helmets I love it. on my bookshelf, so it's great. But yeah, give me give me uh, give me Temple plus the nine here. I, I think I think what we saw from the second half defensively from Temple, I think that will give uh, Sun some problems. And wouldn't shock me at all to see uh, the Owls pull the outright upset. But I'm going to take uh, take the nine here. One thing that's worth noting that, that we jo joked about with the way Temple played uh, uh, against Akron is if if you have a good side of the ball offense or a good team. You should play well against bad teams. I think people yeah. discredit that way too much when they say, "Oh, it was just so and so." But yeah, how many times do we see the other, you know, the Baylor, Texas State, right? Like the other way it goes. Mm -hmm. If you're a good defense, to your point about Temple, you play well against Akron. Also, I was uh, looking at this game too. Temple has an, a, a bunch of pro prospects on the offensive side of the ball: quarterback, running back, yeah. wide receiver. They have more talent than Rutgers. So, so Temple here plus the nine points. <laughs> I love it. The next one up here in your fifth bear bet. We're going five this week. New Mexico State at Liberty. Liberty is favored by 11. The total is 53 and a half at the time of recording here. New Mexico State 1-1. One one, lost to UMass and beat Western Illinois. Decent rushing numbers. Liberty took down Bowling Green last week. Yeah, 34, sure 24 covering by two points. Liberty forced five turnovers. That's the thing. Weekend. I think this was more bad Bowling Green than it was good Liberty. You mentioned five turnovers, nine penalties, 
2 of 12 on third down. And the turnovers came in very key spots of the field, either deep in their own territory or as they were going in. So this was, I think, it was a very deceiving 10 point win for 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 for, for, for uh, Liberty. Look, they lost in the in the opener. New Mexico State outgained UMass, still managed to lose again. Uh, lost the turnover battle three nine. So it's not like New Mexico State isn't able and willing and ready to help Liberty out in the turnover battle. But I, th but I think with Pavia, the, the, the quarterback in New Mexico State, he, he's a good player. I, I just can't lay double digits with, 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 with Liberty here. Getting 11 points with a team, I think, that kind of figured things out last week in a, in a, in a route of an overmatched opponent. I, I think that was a deceiving box score against UMass in the opener where they lost on their home field. So... Would not surprise me at all to see New Mexico State hang around in this game. Don't know if they can quite pull the outright upset, but 11 points, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll take the Aggies. How much are you watching New Mexico State Liberty, or is it just a wager that you made based off of your knowledge of these teams? I, uh, I will probably watch very, very, very <laughs> little uh, of, of this game. No, it, it's a, again, this is, a, this is the thing where I always like to look at, I'll look at the board, yeah. and, and I'll, I'll look at some... Some some wagering percentage. I'll look at what the game may have opened at and try and see what the the line move is it justified or not. Then I'll go back and look at the box score and be like, Liberty Bowling Green, five turnovers. Like the the way that game, yeah. the bowling was terrible on third down. Like a lot of the high variance, very volatile plays in that game went in the favor of Liberty. That's probably not going to happen again. So you, you would expect a little bit of a, a scoring regression, I think, in in, the, in in them to play a little more. Closer games, and remember last year too. Liberty, Liberty lost a couple of times outright. It's a big favor. We, we hit on like Notre Dame losing a couple of games is like fourteen point favorites or more. Liberty did the same thing. So they, it, it's not like this is a team that is a sure thing on its home field as a double digit favorite. Well, let's recap your five bear bets of week two in college football. The first one we have here is Texas Tech at home getting six and a half points against Oregon. We talked about Tech off a bad loss at Wyoming coming back home. Their Cal Pato after dark hosting. Auburn there. Cal plus six and a half. I think Cal wins that game outright. USC late at night as well. A packed off the dark special. Two for Bear this week. Minus the 29 points for the USC Trojans. We have Temple at Rutgers. What a matchup. Temple plus nine. And finally, New Mexico State at Liberty. New Mexico State getting the 11 points. Great logo, by the way. I mean, you have it to is a great, New Mexico State. It is a great logo. We heard the feedback. You guys want more games. We're going to talk about Alabama, Texas. We're talking about Miami and NAM, Utah, Baylor. We're going to do that all in the gambling group chat. It's going to be me, Bear, Sammy P, and Will Hill. Let's get into that. Well, the best segment of the show, at least my favorite segment of the show, is back. The group text thread is, is here. Jeff and I, again, joined by Will Hill and Sam Penianovich. And uh, we kicked around a bunch of stuff last week and, and had some fun and uh, got off to, I think, a pretty good start with their season win totals. Uh, Buffalo couldn't quite get there for you, but, but they played well on the big LSU loss. was was uh, great on Sunday night. We don't want to kind of live in the past or anything, but I, this week typically is one of my favorite weeks of the college football season to bet because you get so many overreactions to what we saw in week one. The kind of what, how are you guys approaching week two? Like, what have you learned from week one that you think is real? What have you learned from week one that you think might be a little, a, a little not real, a little fake, a little fugazi, as some people might say? I, there's so many massively public sides this week. Sides like Notre Dame, like Oregon, like like are, are these like auto fades for you guys, or 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 are you looking maybe to approach it a different thing? What do, what do you think, Sammy? <laughs> Could be one of the most public sides maybe ever in college football. I was talking to Dave Mason who book, uh, books bets offshore, and he's like, not only will this be the most bet college football game of all time, this will be the most public side of all time. And yet people are like, well, you can't bet against Colorado. The hell I can't. What are you talking about? This game was eight <laughs> on the look ahead. Nebraska was an eight point favorite. And now after winning the national championship in week one, Colorado is laying three <laughs> points and I have to go back to the well and go against the Buffaloes. I have to. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I do. I, I, 
No, I, I, mean, I was well, just going to say, I, I agree with betting Nebraska. To me, it's just a matter of when. Like, do you, do you just wait for a three and a half? And as soon as you three, three and a half, you jump on it because there was one slightly, you know, for, for a bit yesterday, or you just wait till right before kickoff, thinking the ball's just going to keep rolling, keep rolling. And to me, it's just when you bet it. I, I agree. I, I think there will be a point at some point this year where these numbers might not catch up. Like, it's going to come later in the year, I think, when. Look, they're going to score on anybody. I mean, the offense is really good, but what happens when an offensive lineman gets hurt? When a defensive linebacker goes like, they're, they're look last week as big as that win was, they should have given up fifty six to TCU. They had an interception in the end zone, and then the ridiculously great play by By Hunter on the other interception. So they're going to score on anyone. But I, I'm, I'm curious later in the year once they start playing some some whether USC where they play Oregon and some of the other teams in the Pac-12 maybe they're they're dinged up up front and they're not a deep team at all that's going to be I think the time when you strike against Colorado are you are you, are you, you buying on your uh, Pac-12 uh, conference mate there I don't know if I'm buying on it but I think their offense is for real uh, their offense line had issues but Sean Lewis the OC did a great job of scheming up ways to get his guys into space the question I have with Colorado is how long can Travis Hunter keep up this pace? 145 snaps in week one. I think they transition him more to defense, but against the bigger opponents, Nebraska, Oregon, USC, he probably will have to play both ways. But I'm buying Colorado being able to score points. But as Bear mentioned, defense issue, offense line issue, how long can they keep this going? The hardest part for me between week one and week two is when I get a chance to watch these teams play is trying to figure out, did they, you know, did what they show in week one, is that who they are? Was it a bad game? Was it the atmosphere? And does that translate to week two? Because we know sometimes we're wrong about a team's profile, right? They just aren't as good as we think. And, and is week one uh, indicative of a future season when they're not very good? That, that, that to me is the hardest part of, of week one. Some of the games you mentioned, I think I'm having that issue trying to figure out, is it football? Was it something else? Was it atmosphere? Are you going back home and playing better? And now Colorado's opportunity again on a big stage against Nebraska, who, who offensively was atrocious. But again, is that just week one sort of not, not knowing what they're going to be in offense? And now week two, they take that big jump. Well, I would expect to see Jeff Sims probably run the ball 25, 30 times to try and keep that Colorado offense off the field. Another team that I mentioned a little, Notre Dame, <laughs> like Navy is, but my takeaway from week zero was that Navy's terrible. And yeah, Notre Dame blew them out as they should have. Then you beat Tennessee State, an FCS team. Now you're laying north of a touchdown at Carter Finley against an NC State team that the defense isn't as good as it was last year, but it's the first real team Notre Dame's facing this year. I remember a couple of years ago, it, it, it was a sloppy game in the in pouring rain. And, and I, I, I look, Jeff, you, you could probably tell me if I'm wrong. Coaches say all the time, like the biggest improvement you're going to make from week in the season is from week one to week two. Like it was kind of an uninspired win that NC State had. Armstrong looked a little out of sorts against UConn. You kind of kind of scrapped around and hung in there like, it's NC State or nothing here, isn't it, Sammy? Well, we actually bet over 50, Bear. I think if Notre Dame is going to give up some some wiggle room, it's on the defensive side of the ball. We know their O-line's very good. I like Estime a lot. And look, Hartman's going to be able to throw the ball deep. They haven't had a deep threat in a long time in Notre Dame. So we bet over 50 and 50 and a half. You can now go 51. Obviously, that's a, a pretty big key number in football. But Anything under 51 in the hook, I think, is good. I think this is a game that's maybe played in the high 20s, like a 28-27 game. I'm definitely with you, though. I'm not going to lay seven and a half with Notre Dame. We like over. Yeah, it'd be, I mean, the NC State or pass for me. I, I bet NC State plus seven and a half. So I, you know, okay, it scares me a little bit. That's a funky three-three-five defense for NC State, and Hartman has seen that a few times being in the ACC. So that's one little subtlety of the game that does concern me. But to me, this is still a lot of points. That's a tough building to play, uh, and I wasn't shocked they struggled with UConn. UConn's not that bad. That was sort of a an in the muck type of game that I was expecting against UConn. Close, low scoring. Uh, you're going to need to get some bigger plays if you're NC State. I think their biggest play last week was like 19 yards. So you're going to hit need to hit some explosives and, and be better in that department. But uh, I like NC state. I think they're right in this game. They're also off a bye, right? They played week zero and got last week off to reorganize themselves to play Notre Dame team. I think that really is going to help them offensively to figure out who they are. Uh, I'm not on this game at all. This this one scares me. But Notre Dame's offensive line, as Sam mentioned, is really good. And that that gives me reason to believe they can score points in this game. They, they can grind a team out and be able to really physically take it to NC State in a way that NC State obviously hasn't seen yet just playing uh, UConn so far. TCU obviously won Big 12 massive loser uh, in week one as a 
north of a 20-point favorite. There was an even bigger one with Baylor <laughs> losing his close to a 30-point favorite home against uh, a newcomer, uh, G.J. Kinney in, in, in Texas State. They're one on the road to Wigo and one. Blake, Blake Chapman is not going to play for Baylor, the quarterback, which is a big deal. And now you got Utah coming in. But look, you always have that. We always have that like water cooler discussion. Did, did Utah win the game or did Florida lose it? it was, look, I didn't think Utah looked that great against Florida. I think that was more bad Florida than it was great Utah. I'm still not sure if Rising is going to play or if he does, if he's going to be 100%. Now you're going to lay north of a touchdown on the road and kind of a, a, a circle of the wagons, must win kind of. Dave Arand is a very prideful guy, really good defensive guy. You would think ba- it, it, Baylor will show up here and give Utah game. Yeah, Jeff, I know you're a, b- a big Pac-12 guy. But you, you get that same feel about the Utes and dangerous spot for them? I think you have to play the under of 47 here. I know the total was was this low of 45. I think it kicked off against Florida and easily went under. You mentioned Utah played well on defense, which against a Florida team might not be hard to do. But Florida had a lot of mistakes, uh, the, uh, personnel issues, offside, you know, offside. They had a couple of good fourth down plays in that game too, like the fourth and 14. Run yeah. the little, there's a little short slant. Let the receiver try and break three tackles. <laughs> it, it, was, it was not, it was not great. <laughs> but more importantly, about why I don't think you take Utah in this situation, they're still going to be down. Down about eight starters, right? Uh, Cam Rising, I do not expect to play in this game. And and bear mention, the Utah offense guys wasn't that great. They had a home run in the first play of the game, right? That no one expected them to do. And then Nate Johnson had that long touchdown run. That was about it. They scored one second half touchdown. That was off a, a turnover by Florida. And it's no surprise, right? They have a third string quarterback and then a four string quarterback and Johnson, who they really used up sort of all their plays. They, you know, they can run the same sort of uh, offense back, but he really can't throw the ball very well. So there's not much offense for Utah to be had here. I know Baylor is down their quarterback, but I would go under here. I go under 47 and be fine with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of thinking the same way. I'm surprised you say that because you look at Baylor. I mean, there's 73 points scored in the game last week, but I, I'm with you where it would be under with, you know, two backup quarterbacks, most likely. Whittingham's a conservative coach to begin with, so I could see a scenario where they just dominate the game in the trenches, both sides of the ball. Baylor's not good on the offensive line, so, you know, Utah gets a lead, and then they just take the air out of the ball and play conservative. That's not a that's not a fun one, though. Again, when, when it's 42, what was it, 42-31 last week, Texas State and Baylor, now you're going to go under 47. That would be the play but that's uh that's not a fun one to sweat out i think we have to talk about too bear like why laying seven and a half and eight is a bad habit there's a couple reasons why this look ahead number was utah four four and a half baylor looks awful line goes up but then earlier this week this thing was sitting seven and a lot of people will text me on saturday morning and go hey who do you like and i'm like well i made all my bets on monday and tuesday and wednesday because like i I got better numbers you're constantly laying seven and a half and eight when the line was six on the open and then seven for the majority no, no, no. of the week, that is a bad habit, and we have to break those habits. Yep. Well, bad habits, Miami and Texas A&M have had a bad, a bad habit of losing or playing down to the level of competition lately. And, look, I don't know if either of these teams are going to threaten for their conference titles or threaten to get to the conference championship game, but the one thing Miami and Texas A&M did last week was – blow out an inferior opponent. We haven't seen that from Miami in a long time. A&M was lethargic last year doing it as well. This is a game, I I am a Miami alum. I want no part of this game. Uh, I have to see it to believe it with Miami. I actually think A&M might be pretty good this year. I mean, Evan Stewart is, is an absolute dude. It looks like Miami has taken some money this week. I think this number is down to four, four and a half uh, in, in a lot of players, in, in a lot of places that, I, I just can't get all the way there yet with Miami. But at the same time, I do see, a, look, as bad as they were last year, they went on the road to College Station with a lot of offensive issues and and were in that game till the fourth quarter. So this game is a pass for me. Anybody have any thoughts on Miami, Miami A&M side or total? Nah, pass for me. I thought about the dog, but no bets. I might end up betting Miami here. I thought that, like you said, I thought they should have won last year in A&M, and A&M and they're better this year. Miami is. And uh, I like the matchup. Lance Gidry, the defensive coordinator for Miami, was one of the better defensive coordinators in the country yeah. against an offensive line for A&M, which I'm not sure how good, uh, you know, how good they are. Uh, look, I'll take the four points. I think Miami's got a really good shot to win this game. 
I just don't know what AM has done to deserve to be a favorite in this game, right? Um, I've been high on, on Miami all offseason. I, I know Mario Cristobal, he was at Oregon, so maybe there's some bias here, but I saw him build the Oregon program in the second season with a big roster turnover into a Rose Bowl champion. And he did the same thing in Miami. He, he redid that roster, he hired new coaches, and they're a much more talented football team. We saw that talent on display in their week one game. And he's always been up for these games. You know, Oregon played well in these big non-conference games. They didn't play so well against the Middle Tennessee States, right, at times, but they played well when AM is coming to town or when they're going to Ohio State. And so I think Mark Crystal will, will have his team ready, and I'd be very happy to take Miami plus four. It's not my favorite of the weekend, but I don't know what AM has done to deserve to be a favorite in this game. I, I think the well, one thing that here. I had. Taking notes, Jeff might have a Miami bias because of Cousin. Taking notes there. I thought Van Dyke looked good. I don't know how much you guys watch Miami versus Miami of Ohio. I mean, I, I'm sure most people didn't, but I thought Van Dyke looked really good. Remember two years ago, he looked really good. Last year was awful. Uh, I was encouraged by what I saw last week. Yes. Yeah, the, the, coordinator, the coordinator change, I think, will do him wonders. And yes. the one thing that I did take away from that, from that game was their offensive line actually looked – physical for the first time in a long time. And, and Mario being a prideful South Florida, former Miami offensive lineman, you knew that would be the one area that he would improve dramatically. And, and I think he did uh, last week. So I'll be curious to see against a really good defensive front uh, if that can continue. And it wasn't just a byproduct of playing a Mac team. I, I'd feel rem remiss if I didn't just bring up uh, the biggest game of the week, Alabama, Texas. N num numbers right at seven. So it kind of feels like they're letting – uh, they're saying you decide what way you want to go and we'll move it to six and a half or we'll move it to seven and a half, depending on what, 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 what you guys think. I think Texas has a really good chance to win this game out, right? Like, like, I don't think this is a great Alabama defense. I, I think they're good, but it doesn't, I don't think they're like vintage Nick Saban type defense. I obviously Milrow is going to run circles around middle Tennessee state, but, but against Texas, that front seven of Texas is really really good. So I think they're going to give Alabama problems. I, I think Texas is a dog. It's very, very uh, attractive. I think the under here is very attractive as well because I think Texas' defense will do a good job against Bama. And, I, and I'm not sure Quinn Ewers is all the way there yet. I thought we'd hear a lot of talk this week about how uh, Texas should have won last year, dirty hit, uh, Ewers got knocked out, uh, Bama lucky to win. Uh, I, I thought uh, Bama was going to get a ton of – Bama is going to get revenge this year here. And I haven't heard a ton of that. Like, so, look, Texas's offense didn't start great against Rice, but they kind of worked themselves into the game, and, and, and Bama was Bama against an overmatched opponent. But, but Texas is kind of attractive here, I think. I would say Bama, the one thing I noticed last week and, and just, you know, going over the roster, they do not have the embarrassment of riches that they usually have at, you know, receiver running back mm -hmm. where they're just two, three deep with pro right. after pro, which plays into your point about the under, you know, young quarterback to save and trust him right away in a big game. Maybe both teams come out a little tight here. There's a little, a little bit of, you know what, be conservative early on. So uh, to me, it would be under, and, and you know, if it's a lower scoring game, obviously the points look attractive. And, and like you mentioned, if you like Texas, find the seven and a half. If you like Bama, find the seven or, you know, I don't know if there's six and a half still out there, but that's, that's bouncing around a key number. So make sure you get the good one. Yeah, totally nailed it about the number. You got to lay seven and you got to take seven and a half because both numbers are available. I actually texted you bear offline yesterday. I was like, what are we doing? Bama, Texas. And you said Texas. And I'm like, damn it. We are heads up here. One of my favorite spots over the years is the, is the take that Bama team that's sort of laying in the weeds and nobody wants to mm -hmm. bet them. Like, in what world are we not excited to lay seven with Alabama against a former assistant? And here's the crazy part, too. Last year, I know they had Bryce Young and Jameer Gibbs and Will Anderson. Those are three top 10 picks or top 15 picks. That number, though, was 20. And now it's seven. This feels like it's way too low here, Jeff. I think they're telling you Alabama's not as talented as they've been in the past. And Texas, as Bear mentioned, you might dislike Sark's play calling and like the way he, he uses quarterbacks, but he has done a great job of building up the offensive defensive lines and kind of building up the back of that defense as well. Like, this is a much more talented Texas team than we've had in many years. And they can go into Alabama and probably physically withstand the Alabama team, which, again, is not as good as they've been in the past. They have a sort of a talent drain over the years. It makes a, a bunch of sense with Georgia's success, LSU's success, and NIL and transfer portal, all those things that have kind of 
have hurt Alabama and their roster, but good. Still, still a great football team. Still one of the best in college football. But I think Texas, talent-wise, can go into Alabama and give them a game. I have no play on this game, but I understand why the odds makers have made it seven points. Yeah, this is one of those games where, like, this is one of those like pool sheet games where you're in a pool and it's going to be on there. What way you lean? You got to pick one or the other. Texas would be the way I, w- I would lean, but it's certainly not one of the the better opinions I have of the week. Will Sammy, let's get uh, your thoughts on it. what what we miss. What's your uh, what's your best thought of the week? What, what's the uh, what what game didn't we hit that you guys feel strongly about? I want to give you guys a chance to. Uh, I, I don't want, I don't want to be Gill or Choice here. I want to let you guys uh, give your opinion. I'll go first here. This is just a general thought, and I'll, I'll turn it into more of a question because Bear, you're, you've been betting these games for a long time. I'm not calling you old, but I guess I'm not not calling you old. I am old. What is with I'm these new trends? Okay, tell like correct me if I'm wrong. Is this not a new trend here where these teams are up by 20, 30 points and instead, you know, four or five minutes left, instead of taking knees or just running up the middle and punting, they're going fast paced. They're punching in the end zone. Penn State, yep. uh, who else was it? Central Florida. Is this uh, not no, a new no, thing? No one, no one loves the betting. late backdoor cover than James Franklin. He, James oh, Franklin yeah. is the master at that. He will do it every chance he gets. But you're right. Even in the Florida State LSU game, I mean, you know, Norvell had an opportunity to just kind of take a knee there. And just run the run the clock. I, that was I think now in the college football playoff era, like teams are looking for a big margin of victory to kind of have an eye popping score. And I think it might also be a little bit of a byproduct of the new clock rules, where you don't get as many plays earlier in the game. And maybe you have incentives contractually to score a bunch of points and, and you don't want your, you don't want your point totals looking low for some reason. So you're actually going to use some of those plays later in the game uh, to maybe mask the shortcomings earlier in the game where you didn't have as many plays. So that's just a quick knee jerk off the top of my head thought as to what you might be seeing. Is it that, or is it make your boosters happy? Because it's, it's usually right around the number. It's like these coaches <laughs> seem to know the number. I don't know. No. It, it's make your boosters happy. They're paying these kids the NIL money because you want to spread the wealth uh, around your roster, right? So, so, so at the end of games, you've opportunities to get someone an extra touchdown, to get someone some extra touches, to put in a backup quarterback and let them run the offense. To me, it's about appeasing your roster and not just backing down the end of a game. If you can get a backup running back four, five, six touches, you can get some backup offensive linemen in the game. You can throw the ball as, as Bear mentioned to Florida State's tight end, who had done a great job blocking all game. I, th- I think it was number six. Get him on a little. Oh on that little screen and go play, right? Like you, you, you can give these guys opportunities to make them happy to, 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 to feel that they're fulfilled in, in their obligations as a student athlete, right? Like to me that it's about that more than it is about the spread or, or trying to run the score, but just making sure that everyone has an opportunity to touch the football. I didn't hear anything anybody just said. I heard James Franklin and I had PTSD when I had <laughs> Illinois plus a couple of years ago. Illinois was up by four, and then Penn State scored 42 unanswered to cover. I will never, ever forget that as long as I live. I'll go quick here. We were digging through the garbage at Ohio this week. It sounds like Curtis' work is good to go, and what was reported against San Diego State is not true. They were saying it was a knee injury. It was not. We're being told concussion. He got his bell rung against San Diego State, had to miss the game against Long Island. By all accounts, Curtis Rourke is going to play for Ohio, and we like the over. You can find 61 and a half between Ohio and Florida Atlantic. We think fireworks, Bear. Yeah, Rourke back at quarterback against the Tom Herman offense. I I would kind of uh, agree with you there. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you. Let's have a great weekend, and we'll do it again next week. Another fun segment with the guys. Hope you guys got a lot of information there to help you out on Saturday with your wagers. Let's recap all of Bears wagers so far. We have the Texas Tech Raid Raiders plus six and a half. Cal plus six and a half as well, hosting Auburn. USC laying the 29 points against the Stanford Cardinal. The uh, Temple Owls plus nine at the what New York New Jersey State State, School. State University of New Jersey. So, <laughs> so last week we had a PU, and they certainly were a PU for sure. And <laughs> Uh, Fresno State. Great, by the way, got a great observation by you last week about the the longtime established head coach against yeah. the guy with the a new quarterback and a first game as a head coach. Congratulations. I, I like it. There we go. Good job, Jeff Tedford. La- one more wager, by the way. You have New Mexico State plus 11. The boys from Las Cruces. Uh, against, uh, against Liberty here. Uh, a couple games I think we missed so far. You had mentioned uh, UCLA, San Diego State. Yeah. Uh, oh, boy. I, I, I'd say, I, look, San Diego State, it, like, 
It's not a – they are a an offensively challenged football team. And now I think Chip's got his quarterback in Dante Moore. Be very curious to see how much he plays if he does start. I would expect that he yeah. would after what we saw from Ethan Garbers. That's a very interesting game. I think Tulane all Miss is going to be an interesting yeah. game as well. Did you have something on UCLA? Well, UCLA, UCLA thing is like, I don't know how you don't take the under in all their games for right now. Um, they're, they, Chip, Chip, he bitched about it. He was upset about the, he oh, yeah. four percent. Like they run, they're running the football yep. team and their offensive line, some issues. I think, I think week one, figuring things out. San Diego State can't score. The game against Ohio hurt me, hurt me as an offensive player to watch them move the ball. Like <laughs> this game just screams like 2017, right? Like it's just going to every, be every San Diego games. State feels like it's 2017. Ooh, yeah. Uh, Tulane, by the way, sold out hosting Old Miss. Did your thoughts about Tulane change at all after last weekend? I, I was very surprised at how well they put Pratt had an unbelievable game, and it, they looked like a program that Willie Fritz now is kind of built for the long haul. I, I don't know if they're still the best group of five team or not, but they absolutely dominated the South Alabama team that I thought could play could play well with them. Speaking of, of, of that, that area of the country, Southern Miss is a massive underdog against Florida State. Like, I'm curious, too, like short week, hangover, Big win against LSU. Here's little old Southern Miss coming in who you have zero respect for. This kind of feels like sleepwalking at Doe Campbell, kind of just going through the motions and or, Southern Miss might be worth the play here. Or the opposite happens. They feel like they can win a championship and they come back with a vengeance in week two. Just sort of their, their defensive line bear is so good. Is. Southern Miss might have no chance to even move the ball <laughs> in, in this game. The, the, the last one I'm eyeing, um, Wisconsin goes to Washington State. Washington getting, I believe, six and a half points. Maybe it's down to six points now. It's a Mike Leach tribute game. Yep. Washington State feels scorned by all the college football realignment. Like, I feel like this is a tough environment for Wisconsin. Uh, a a, a first-year coach there, obviously. Figuring out what to do on offense. Washington can always play defense mm -hmm. under Jay Dickard. They brought in a coordinator from Western Kentucky. I, I think I, I'm glad taking the six points. But I think Wazoo wins this game. First time since 1998 they have hosted a non-conference Power 5 opponent up in Pullman. You know, Pullman, another one of those. We talked about yes. the travel itinerary to Lubbock. See, I think Pullman, that's actually a nice drive since, from Spokane. Yeah. I just fortunately <laughs> didn't do it in the middle of a rainstorm or ice storm or fog. Uh, yes, I've done it there many times, and it's uh, it's quite a, it's quite a journey. Smallest Division One stadium, uh, I believe, in college football, or Power 5 stadium in college football. I think Wisconsin loses that game. Am, am I on the right track there? I, I, th I think you are. Anytime you're, you're laying right around, Laying points on the road against a, a very capable team, a new new quarterback, new coach. Like that's they're they're often the, the, the dairy raid took time to to get yeah. going last week. This was kind of the game last year too, where the warning signs were really realized with Wisconsin. The game against Wazoo. Yeah. So maybe there's a little bit of revenge at stake as well, but. I, I certainly couldn't lay the points here. All right, Bears, time for our best bets of the week. Let's look at how we did in week one. You were 1-0. and oh, I was 0-1. Oh how about this? I had the under in a game. There were 32 <laughs> points in the fourth quarter, and there were 28 scored in the fourth quarter, Bear. A kickoff return and a pick six. Well, that's, what, that's what Will was talking about in the gambling group chat about how these teams and coaches now are just – Look at it, score late and, and 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 put some of these games over the total. And you, and you you brought up as well, make the boosters happy. And your best bet won by half a point. Should have won by two touchdowns. Yeah, that, that's the thing. I, I was sitting there like in, in in Fort Worth watching the game, and and when when they threw the pick in the end zone, I'm like, oh god. And then when they drove out, Hunter made the great tackle. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, they're okay. They'll still score. And then he makes the pick, and I'm like, you got. I'm like, if I lose this under, that should be over midway in the third quarter. I am gonna. Absolutely lose it and hate this season already. But best bet this week, we mentioned it already in the in the five that I gave out. Temple plus the nine against the State University of New Jersey. The defense played really well in the second half. They got to work their way into the game, allowed 40 yards in the second half against a, a team that I think they just kind of slept walked in the first half. Rutgers didn't even average four yards of play against a bad Northwestern team. They're just on prerogative's sake, you got to take Temple plus plus the points here. And I think the Owls have a uh, Good chance to win this game outright. You know Bears making this wager because no sane person would give out Temple plus nine unless they had their own money on it. No, yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're not going to get Bear giving Alabama, Texas best bet, Miami A&M best. No, you, you, you're going to get a Temple best bet, and then you're going to get like a, a New Mexico State play along the way. This is the wheelhouse right here. These are the games that we love. Well, let's get to, to my best bet of the week. It is the over 
in the Coliseum. It's over 69 and a half points between Stanford and USC. Stanford uh, looked a competent offense uh, with, with Troy Taylor as a new coach, with Daniels at quarterback that scored 37 points at Hawaii. They can move the ball on USC, but more importantly, USC's offense, guys, is even maybe even better than last year. 56 points in game one, 66 in game two. The over is hit in 13 of 16 Lincoln Riley games combined with their offense and their poor defense. This might go over the third quarter. And also worth noting, too, is, as, as we mentioned throughout the show, backups are still trying to score. Last weekend, USC had 49 points, and their backups scored three touchdowns. Three touchdowns, Bear. Like, this is an opportunity, I think, to uh, to get this game over in the third quarter. A lot of points will be scored. And lastly, too, Stanford's not going to give up. They're going to keep trying to score and score and score in this game, even if they're down big. They're not going to pull their starters. I like the over here in the Coliseum late. I'm not staying up to watch this game, though. I'm not staying up to 2 a.m., no? but I'll wake up in the morning and see that it cashed. See, the, the great thing about the, the the schedule for me this week is I'll be getting home from Colorado right around midnight or so Eastern time. So I'm going to get home, fire up. The, why, why are we already asleep? I'm just going to go downstairs, fire up the TV, and, uh, and tune into some of these late night games. It's going to be great. Fantastic. That is a wrap for week two of college football. Big New Kickoff presents Bear Bets Pod. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, every place you uh, are active on social media. Make sure you download it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We're on YouTube as well. Wherever you get your normal podcast, College Football Week 2 pod in the book. NFL pod will be posted on Friday, first one of the year. Really excited about that as well. Uh, always remember, the less you bet, the more you lose when you win.